Can contraceptive Catholics receive Holy Communion? That's the topic for today's Let's Talk show. Now, Lisa, that's really serious stuff. That if we avail, go to the Eucharist in a state of mortal sin, that we're eating and drinking condemnation upon ourselves. My name is Lisa O'Hare and I'm joined by Patrick McChrystal. Patrick, you're very welcome today again to the show. Hello, it's great to be here, Lisa. So this is a very delicate subject. Um, we're going to get straight to the point, reminding ourselves that Pope Pius XI termed the use of contraception as a grave sin. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that contraception and sterilization are intrinsically evil. Now, the Code of Canon Law, paragraph 916 states, a person who is conscious of grave sin is not to celebrate mass or receive the body of the Lord without previous sacramental confession. Yes, Lisa, and indeed uh, Pope John Paul II, he himself reiterated this when he said that anyone conscious of grave sin must receive the sacrament of reconciliation before coming to communion. Now, it's really important to say that we cannot possibly uh, begin to even judge the, the state of a soul of, of a contraceptive Catholic uh, receiving the Eucharist because we, we don't know the mitigating circumstances, uh, the conscious awareness of the person involved, their level of catechetical formation, or that they even know that it's a grave sin. But what we are doing today is that we are um, raising crucial matters for discussion. Now, neither you, Lisa, or I are qualified in this whole area of canon law, or, but, but even a cursory reading of what the church is teaching on this subject makes it very clear that there are very serious issues for everyday Catholics uh, in ordinary life. And what we're doing today is that we're raising and airing these matters for discussion and bringing them to people's uh, attention. Now, um, one thing that's become very clear is that every one of us has a duty to uh, inform our conscience and that there's a pressing need here for everyone to inform ourselves of the matters that we're bringing to uh, people's attention today. And it would be very negative for someone to say, and, put, and someone puts themselves in a very difficult position, if they say, well, my conscience is clear, I've prayed about it, and I'm okay contraception while it's going to the Eucharist. So we just need to look at a few other dimensions here. Well, I think that is one of the dimensions that we have to understand. And, and again, it comes back to catechesis to understand even what the, our conscience is and how that it must be informed or else it's just a feeling that we're going with and that doesn't count. Now, think John Paul II in his encyclical Ecclesia de Eucharista, he stated that the judging of one's state of grace obviously belongs only to the person involved since it is a question of one's conscience. So that's where we don't want to overstep the mark, but that's where we want to bring, uh, as you said, into this discussion and try to inform our conscience and to help people to inform their own consciences. Now, um, there's another document that we'll, we'll quote and, and show on the screen here um, from the US Catholic bishops. They stated that in order to receive Holy Communion, we must be in communion with God and with the church. Mortal sin constitutes a rejection of communion with God and destroys the life of grace within us. Now the bishops went on to clarify that mortal sin is an act violating God's law that involves grave matter, that it's performed with full knowledge and complete consent of the will. In order to be considered a mortal sin, it has to have all of those three components. And that's why we emphasize that we cannot judge the state of another person's um, soul because we don't know those elements, particularly of full knowledge and complete consent. So there's a lot, a lot of talk about communion and what exactly that is and how, you know, the bond between ourselves and God. And Pope John Paul, again, in his encyclical, he said the celebration of the Eucharist cannot be the starting point for communion. Mm -hmm it presupposes that communion already exists. So it's That's this, right, Lisa. yeah, That's right. united with God. And if we are living in a state of sin, we've already broken our communion with him. Um, again, going back to the, the bishops, the American bishops, they stated, if we rejected communion, we no longer share in the common bond of the divine life of the Holy Spirit. 
because our sin has separated us from God and our brothers and sisters in Christ, we have forfeited our right to receive Holy Communion. For the Eucharist by its very nature expresses and nurtures this life-giving unity that the sinner has now lost. So we can, we can still be members of the church and continue to be part of the Catholic Church, but they actually said we will have become lifeless or dead members because we've cut off the life of grace. Patrick, you have another very strong um, scriptural quote regarding uh, cutting ourselves off from grace. Yes, uh, Pope John Paul II, in that same encyclical that you quoted there about the Eucharist, he, he cites a, a passage from 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 27 to 30. And that passage from Corinthians states, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. It says a person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many among you are ill and infirm, and a considerable number are dying. Now, Lisa, that's really serious stuff. That if we go to the Eucharist in a state of mortal sin, that we're eating and drinking condemnation upon ourselves. But... Pope uh, St. Paul, at the time of writing this to the Corinthians, he even pointed out something like really stark. He said, this is why many among you are ill and infirm and a considerable number are dying. And that, that's something that I've scarcely even thought of before till we started doing our, our research for this uh, program today. Yeah, I mean, it's striking. What strikes me again is that idea that we are bringing condemnation upon ourselves. You know, if we're presenting ourselves in a state of sin, you know, the light of the Eucharist will shine into all of our dark corners and we will have presented ourselves to be judged. And so, such is the seriousness of that. And I think our, our priests and our bishops are trying to get us to understand the level of seriousness. Um, that Saint John Paul, again, in that encyclical, he referred to the scriptural passage that you spoke about. And he quoted another great saint, Saint John uh, Chrysostom. And he said, with his stirring eloquence, I too raise my voice, I beseech, beg and implore that no one draw near to the sacred table with a sullied and corrupt conscience. Such an act, in fact, can never be called communion. Not even were we to touch the Lord's body a thousand times over, but condemnation, torment, and increase of punishment. Very strong words, Patrick. Yes, very much so, Lisa. And there is a canon lawyer, a lady, uh, Jenna Cooper. She, she wrote about this very subject. And she said, receiving communion while knowingly being in a state of grave sin is in fact a grave sin in and of itself. And that means that you're, we're compounding the situation if we ever find ourselves uh, in that situation. Now, the question arises, is anyone ever worthy of receiving the Eucharist, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Technically, no. But the church tells us that only those people who are in a state of mortal sin should uh, exclude themselves from the Eucharist. In fact, that the Eucharist wipes away venial sins and the Eucharist also strengthens us against the temptation to being vulnerable to committing mortal sin. Lisa, um, I, you, have, you have a bit of a personal experience to share on this subject. Yes, Patrick, um, and, and even before I, I share it, the whole idea that this is for our good, this is not a punishment per se, that, that, you know, that we can't receive Holy Communion when we're in a state of mortal sin. This is for our good. And I, I experienced, when I was at university, I was really struggling with serious sin. Um, I had no peace. And I, you know, I was going just through a very tough time. I knew I was committing a grave sin. And I was wrestling with the church's teaching on it. And I remember distinctly on one occasion that I didn't go up to Holy Communion because of the state that I felt myself in. And the pain of the separation 
with or you know from Jesus from our Lord was so much and so striking and so hard to bear that it really clarified my thinking because it it, it really sort of crystallized for me the choice that I had you know it was God or the world and, and who did I want or what did I want more and I really knew at that moment that I wanted God more now it wasn't an and it wasn't an immediate um solution to my problems but it certainly led me on the path to um to deal with what i was dealing with and to try to come into full communion with god and with the church and you know it was that lack of peace that i had and a lot of people scoff at this idea of catholic guilt you know you're just suffering from catholic guilt get over it it was it was a feeling that i have i had deep within me and you can call it that my conscience was nagging me and as i said i was struggling with church teaching so i i wasn't fully informed but there was a feeling within me that that was unsettled and it physically made me ill i you know i did have a breakdown of sorts so i think my voice cut out there i mean what i was saying was that this that decision that i made did bear spiritual fruit it did give me the um desire uh, to make a full conversion and to come into full communion with the Lord. And I would say to anyone out there that for your own physical and spiritual and emotional well-being, not to suppress that voice within you and, and to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with church teaching, struggle and wrestle with it. And, and Lisa, your, church, your story really highlights the, really uh, the important need to abstain from the Eucharist if one is aware that they're involved in, in, involved in, in grave sin. And also, it highlights the duty to inform ourselves of the information and the church teaching on any given subject that any of us can fall into advertently or even inadvertently. Patrick, you know, I, I had this experience at the time with um, priests who, 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 you know, tell me to follow my, my conscience and you know, they were a bit vague about what exactly the church was teaching. You, you've had that experience too. What do we do if our priests tell us it's fine, using contraception is fine? Yes, well, in my own experience as a pharmacist, Lisa, I was a young pharmacist. I knew in my heart that it, that it was wrong. It was against church teaching to be dispensing contraceptive pills. And I went to seven priests and the first six priests every one of them said to me, follow your conscience. And as a soul, I knew I needed to hear the words, you cannot do this. But the first six said, it's okay, follow your conscience. And, but the seventh priest, um, God bless him, he had the courage to say to me, Patrick, you cannot do this. And I knew I needed to hear those words. And when I hear those words, you cannot do this. That's what triggered the decision to no longer continue dispensing contraceptive pills and drugs. Now, Pope Pius XI has some very clear words um, to speak to priests who are in the position of counselling couples um, about this very subject of contraception. Let me share it with you, Lisa. It states, Pope Pius XI, he states in his encyclical uh, Casti Canubia, paragraph 57, he says, we admonish therefore priests not to allow the faithful and trusted to them to err regarding this most grave law of God. He said, if any confessor or pastor of souls who, may God forbid, lead the faithful and trusted to him into these errors, or should at least confirm them by approval or by guilty silence, let him be mindful of the fact that he must render a strict account to God, the Supreme Judge, for the betrayal of his sacred trust, and let him take to himself the words of Christ, they are blind and leaders of the blind, and if the blinds lead the blind, both fall into the pit. I mean, it just shows you again, you know, the importance of our priests, you know, our fathers in the faith to give us that guidance and, and the, the responsibility that they have. You know, this is a matter of life and death. You know, it's the life and death of our souls. And, but it, as you said, Pope, or 
Saint Paul quoted that it does actually physically affect our, our life and our on, on our well being on on this earth as well. Patrick, so just to conclude, um, what the church doesn't it never leaves us high and dry and just says right you cannot uh, receive holy communion and you're not welcome. What what does the church encourage us to do? Yes, Lisa, the church teaches us that those conscious of grave sin um, should go to the sacrament of reconciliation before receiving the Eucharist. And, and is there anything else the church says? Yeah, again, it's, it's, the, it's the, the, the sacrament of reconciliation and Holy Communion are so very closely linked. Um, but the, the bishops, uh, the, the USA bishops, they stated that those who decide appropriately to refrain from receiving Holy Communion for whatever reason should nonetheless participate in the sacrifice of the Mass. You know, it's still important that we attend Mass, that we receive those graces of being present and being in a community with our brothers and sisters. We can, of course, hear and act and allow the Word of God to act within us. And we have the, the you know, we have the opportunity to make a spiritual communion as well. And of course, we have Eucharistic adoration. Patrick, you know, it's a strong message today. We want to encourage people. We want to open up the channels of conversation with between spouses, between friends, with your priests. And we want again to conclude that this is uh, an act of charity on our part. Uh, do you have anything to conclude, Patrick, yourself? No, we're all in the same boat. None of us gets it all right. We all fall somewhere along the ro road, every one of us with something. But Christ and his mercy says to us, as he said to the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. And those are very heartening words for all of us. Thank you listeners for joining us again today. Um, next week, I think Patrick is off. So I will be joined by Aoife and we'll maybe look at our final um, discussion of this series on the effect of the contraceptive pill on a woman's health. Please remember that we at HLI Ireland are working and praying for an Ireland where God is first, life is sacred and the family is cherished. God bless. God bless.